Okay, today we're going to talk about hockey because we covered this topic all year. We're going to be covering four basic points of hockey. Economy, gender, race, and media. So economy. Hockey is well known in a lot of communities that are outside of cities. This is because it's not really a sport for the poor man, and this is because it's such an expensive sport with buying equipment, ice time, and everything else. So obviously it has trouble connecting with the lower class, and they've been trying to do things recently to connect with that. However, it's just been a struggle because of how expensive everything is. So also, the more money people spend on the equipment, the better for stores, so they can hire more people to work on the job. And hockey brings a lot of revenue to Canada, and this is because this is where the sport was founded. There are around 2,500 ice rinks in Canada alone, and also there are over 5,000 full-time hockey jobs in Canada. 2.6 billion US dollars has been generated in running through hockey in the roots of Canada because so many people, they live for hockey, they die for hockey, it's just in their nature. So the Hockey Hall of Fame makes roughly around 7.9 million US dollars a year, and if you think about it, that's really a lot of money for the Hall of Fame. Uh, the NHL teams in Canada also make 750 million US dollars a year, which is a lot more than any other teams in the US, just because this is where the sport was founded and many people love the sport there. Also, there's also more uh, economic input as far as the NHL goes. Um, the National Hockey League Player Association, um, they help give back to the community with the revenue that they make. Um, they, back in 1999, created something called the Goals and Dreams Fund, and with the revenue that they make, they use this money to help kids across the world in struggling areas, um, more inner city stuff because it is one of the most expensive sports, um, and it gives kids uh, the opportunity to play hockey um, that they maybe can't afford it. Um, there's also equipment donations and donations to teams, youth leagues, and stuff like that. And since this uh, has been created, they've helped over 60,000 kids and are given amazing opportunity. Um, so the NHL last year made $4 billion in revenue. Um, so that's, that's a lot of money, obviously. Um, all sports leagues make a lot of money. Um, different ways that they make money is ticket sales, sponsors, the TV revenues and the deals that they have, concessions, and also merchandise. Um, whether it's buying in stadium or from off online sale. Um, other ways actually that the NHL teams can make money is unlike other leagues like the NFL and the NBA, uh, NHL teams actually own the arenas that they play in. So they also get revenue from non-NHL uh, events, including uh, stuff like concerts or if an event had like a circus or something like that, the team actually gets revenue from, uh, gets money from those performances. Um, this is about how teams lose money in the NHL, even though we think that it's a big sports organization, stuff like that. This is one of the leagues that has less money than all of them. Um, the NHL relies mostly on their ticket sales. I know a lot of other organizations do too, but it's because the NFL is a league that has huge TV deals and the NHL doesn't have a lot of TV deals, so they rely heavily on their ticket sales to bring in revenue. Um, the teams that are located in Canada tend to make a lot more money than team struggling teams that are in the US because number one, as Kyle said earlier, hockey was originated in Canada, and the fan base up there is a lot more consistent, they're committed, they, they live for it, it's basically a religion up there. The bigger the arena, the more fans you can fit, and the more fans you have that are diehard fans and show up consistently, the more revenue you make. So there are bigger market teams in the NHL just due to the fact that they have a larger stadium and a better fan base. Um, they also lose money, like I said, because they're not shared with uh, TV deals. So they rely basically on uh, merchandise and also uh, here now to take a further look at this year's outdoor game and the financial health of the league is the NHL COO. He's John Collins. John, great to have you on Street Smart. Thanks Good afternoon. For you know, Michelle, our reporter just report uh, just talked about the amount of sponsors that are, are into the Winter Classic, and it's I think double from what they saw last year. Um, talk to me kind of about the financial gain as a result of the Winter Classic. 
Well, sponsors like big event, you know, things that can break through the clutter, and, and uh, the advertising marketplace has really picked up in fourth quarter, and right. we're seeing a lot of movement. So we've had a, a great uh, response from people like Bridgestone, who sponsored last year's event and want to come back, people like uh, Geico, who are new to the game, and see it as a big event on, on a very important day in sports. Well, what happens to the event going forward? I mean, I think if you guys were talking about doing two games. That didn't happen. Is that going to happen in the future? We, uh, Commissioner Bettman, announced uh, last year out in, uh, last week out in Pebble Beach that we'll do a second game next year in Canada. Be two Canadian teams in a Canadian venue. So that'll be, uh, may not be on January 1st, but that'll be an additional outdoor game. Why didn't it happen this year? We just couldn't, uh, just logistics. I mean, it was one of the things that we were thinking about doing. Right. But uh, I think we put the focus on making sure that this event is as big as it can possibly be. It's a big event, obviously, in Fenway. Right, This right. year, coming off Wrigley last year. So we wanted to put the focus on, on making one more big event. Well, where do you see you see it going going down the road. You can obviously do two games here, but yeah. where, what else? You know, it's uh, we've had 300,000 people on a wait list for tickets, so the place is, is sold out. We have a college doubleheader the week after the event. We have an alumni game with celebrities right. that's sold 25,000 tickets. So I think the demand is there, and there's a number of great hockey markets that really want this thing. So we'll see how it develops. I'm guessing the New York market would like it. Going to bring a game to New York here? We, we hope to bring a game to New York very soon. Very soon. How soon? Uh, as soon as possible. As soon as possible. <laughs> would it be where? At Yankee Stadium, or? I think we looked at Yankee. You know, we've looked. At, uh, we looked at City Field. We, we, did, we visited right? Yankee Stadium when it uh, just before it opened up the season. A spectacular venue, you know, an iconic stadium, which is definitely in the tradition of Wrigley and now Fenway right. Park. So it'd be great to be at Yankee Stadium. All, all, all my guys in the control room are very excited. That's why they <laughs> want to know, know when. Um, let me ask you also about. I mean, after the Classic, you've got the Olympics coming up, and yes. we'll, we'll get some uh, news on that front. I mean, what's the future? Uh, the NHL going to continue to play in the Olympics? Well, this is the fourth Olympic cycle uh, in a four in a four cycle commitment. So I think what we'll do is we'll take a look at at the results and and sort of it's tough to shut down a, a season. What are you looking at though, in terms of you say you're looking at the results? Well, I think it depends on uh, you know the, where, where the winter games are going to be. Okay. So the next ones are out in Sochi, in, in Russia, which is a big time difference right. uh, for North American television marketplace. Right. And so I'm we'll guessing the owners don't like kind of pulling pulling the the players from the regular season. Yeah, pl players love to play in it because it's a big stage. Right. Uh, owners, GMs, coaches are a little less crazy about interrupting the season. Right, so right. we'll see. The Olympics is a big platform. It's a big, important platform. And for a global sport, you know, we, 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 uh, we feel like we should be there. But still an open discussion here. Yes. All right, we'll see what happens here. Let me ask you about, you know, NHL finances. Forbes has been tracking it, I guess, over the last uh, 12 years or so. They talked about last season, how the league was the most profitable. I'm curious about this season in terms of how it's holding up. Well, attendance, which is the big driver in the in, in the league, is still is holding uh, pretty steady right. with last year, which Even is a record year. Even with the recession. Year. Yeah, yeah. We our teams have played to 92 percent capacity through you know the first couple of months of the season, which is. Uh, which is a record again. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, business is looking good. I, again, I think the advertising marketplace really starting to pick up now in fourth quarter is a, is a good omen for us. All right, but better than last season? Well, last year was a record year. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. And uh, I think we're on pace to meet, uh, meet last year. All right, all right, we'll see what happens. But everything's certainly looking, looking good. Yes. All right, we're going to leave it there. Hey, John, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You, Carol. Good luck with the Winter Classic. Thank you. All right, NHL COO John Collins. When the NHL first started in 1917, there was no such thing as the NHL media, or NHL games even be being broadcasted on TV. It wasn't until 1923 that the first game was even broadcasted on, the, on radio, and it was only for the third period of a game between Toronto and the Ottawa Senators. Thirty years later, the first game was broadcast on television between the Montreal Canadiens and the Detroit Red Wings. Today, the NHL is currently in a 10-year deal that's worth $2 billion with the NBC Sports Network. You can watch basically all the games that are on, on the NBC Sports Network for the playoffs and during the regular season. And if you miss a game, you can catch the highlights on the NHL Network the morning after. It's very easy to stay up to date in the NHL. If you have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can follow and get all of the live <coughs> stats. Uh, if somebody gets hurt, you can be notified. Uh, if you don't have Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, you can download the NHL Game Center app, Bleacher Report, uh, the ESPN app, or you can even do these things that are called personal team apps, which is like if you're if you're a Boston Bruins fan, you can download the Boston Bruins app and get all notifications about their team. If you don't have an iPhone or any form of social media, you can also stay up to date with what's going on in the NHL through magazines like 
USA Hockey, uh, New England Hockey uh, Journal, and Hockey News. <coughs> Some current events that are going on right now in the NHL. Uh, the playoffs have just started. Uh, there's the expansion draft, which now there's 30 teams in the NHL, and this coming year there's going to be a 31st team put in, which will be in Las Vegas. And there's a lot of talk about that this is a bad idea because all the gambling and that it's going to be a failure and it's going to look really bad on the NHL. Another thing that's being talked a lot about right now in the media is the new women's league. It was established in 2015. There's currently four teams. One's in Connecticut, one's in Boston, there's Buffalo, New York, and then in New York City. Um, they're, they're talking about doing away with it and they're also talking about sp expanding it. Last year there was a huge injury to a girl on the Boston Pride that uh, actually crippled her for life. Um, <clears throat> another big topic right now is also the NHL award finalists. Uh, in two weeks or three weeks, uh, the NHL awards start and they're naming all their finalists. So in 1957, the color barrier was broken in the NHL by a man named Willie Eldon Ari. He was a left-handed wingman who played for the Boston Bruins for two years. Uh, he played for them in 1957 and then again in 1961. Most of his career was basically in uh, the WHL, which he spent 13 years. It's a uh, Canadian league, and then he split. Uh, he had three and three with the OHL and then the EPHL. He was born in 1935 on October 15th in New Brunswick, and uh, throughout his career, he played in both obviously U.S. and Canada. And he said that in Canada, they were a lot less racist towards him than in the U.S. Another interesting fact was he was 95% blind in his right eye, so he kept that secret to be able to get a chance to play in the NHL on the Boston Bruins. So Willie was basically known as the Jackie Robinson of uh, hockey, really breaking that barrier wide open. So, all right. So the NHL has been known to be a white prominent uh, league, and that trend stays the same. Currently, it's 95% white, and the minorities only take up 5% of the NHL, and that's been the same for a few years now. Back in 2014, there was 86 minority players, and now we're down to just about 40, I think 42. Um, the NFL, uh, uh, the NHL has been no, been criticized for being racist, and it's it's kind of a tough double-bladed sword they have to deal with because of the problems with minorities not being able to get the access to hockey at, an, at a young age and continue it on. So obviously white is more predominant in the NHL than black. And the reason for that is there's a lot of times there's poverty in black communities. Uh, it's, uh, over time we've seen that it's about two times the poverty rate as um, the white people. So. That really makes it hard for black uh, families to get into hockey, especially at a young age with costs going up to about $600 for hockey. Uh, another sport we see the same type of trend is in lacrosse, the same price for per season. And yet again, you see more whites than minorities in that sport. So you can see the correlation between the two. So, and the last but not least, I mean, you need your own equipment in hockey. It's not like football or anything where you can just uh, rent stuff out. You need to have your own stuff, which means you need to buy your own stuff, which is very pricey. Now let's move on to the gender side of this hockey presentation. And uh, as you see at the top of the page, we've got rules. And males and females both have different rules to follow in order to make the game more smoother. Uh, safety-wise, and uh, so obviously males aren't required to wear any masks. Usually you see them wearing visors that cover half of their uh, helmet, and uh, some of them don't even have uh, visors. They just have uh, their regular helmet, and uh, they can check until uh, the refs break it up. Sometimes they just let them play. It really depends on the ref you have and the game that's being played. For females, um, all women, they have to be wearing uh, Fold face masks just to once again like have their safety be covered and um, girls.
girls have very different hitting uh, restrictions. If a girl hits, uh, they're going to be assessed with a penalty. It just depends on how flagrant the hit was or if it was uh, that much of an impact to the game. Division One girls hockey, uh, they had a bit, bit of a scandal where uh, they didn't like how a lot of the men uh, were refing the games, officiating for their uh, their play, and they felt like they're two different kinds of uh, hockey, obviously men and women, they have different rules, and they feel like the women know their rules better, and they feel like they should be able to uh, ref their own games rather than having men ref uh, women and also have men ref men. So, I mean, I agree. I feel like the women should have their say and they should have their opinion because it is, in fact, their game. So I feel it, it doesn't really bother the men. I mean, the men are used to more fast-paced, uh, upbeat games as opposed to women, how they're a little bit slower and they lack a uh, bit of an aggressive edge that the men do have. Let's go to a uh, Canadian goalie. Um, a Canadian goalie made his debut. Uh, her name was Shannon Saba. Excuse my uh, pronunciation on this girl's last name. It's pretty uh, crazy, as you can see. So anyways, uh, this girl has 27 out of 31 shots saved. And um, as you can see, for anyone, that's an incredible performance. But she didn't get recognized. They didn't do any uh, interviews on her, any post-game. Uh, stories just because she was in fact a girl and as we know uh, I think Brody said earlier that race was an issue in Canada's Hockey League and they didn't want to cover a uh, female story because this was in a male league and they wanted to keep it mostly male uh, I mean I personally do not agree with this decision made by Canada but you know how they take their hockey because that's everything they know up there Let's go to the differences they have. Now to talk about the differences of hockey. As we know, uh, it was created in Canada with the men mostly in the beginning. And uh, as time went along, about the 1930s, they started to get women uh, passing with national teams and they weren't allowed to get professional teams yet because that took time. And uh, they do have a professional team for the girls. They only have four teams, like someone said earlier, and it's just not as popular as NHL or any of the other national uh, league teams play because there's just not enough people interested in the, the game for the women's part. And I mean, I hate to see it, but you know, men have overpopulated uh, hockey since day one. And I mean, I don't really see too much of that changing with 